Welcome to AI for Good, the leading action-oriented global and inclusive United Nations platform on AI. Organized by ITU, in partnership with 40 UN sister organizations, and co-convened with Switzerland. The goal of AI for Good is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and scale those solutions for global impact. In today's session, we're counting on you to use the live video wall feature to ask questions and post comments to help create an engaging discussion. We encourage you to stay until the end as we will hold a 30-minute networking session in the neural network. Here you can meet, ask questions to our distinguished speakers, connect, and chat with the AI for Good community. It is now time to kick off the session and welcome our first speaker. The floor is yours. Thank you, Anna. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from me as well. I'm Guillaume Martinez Rora from the International Telecommunication Union, and I would like to welcome you all for joining today's AI for Good webinar on urban robots towards a smarter and more sustainable cities jointly organized by the ITU and UN Habitat. This session is part of the AI for Good programming track where we discuss the role of AI-powered robots in achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We have a distinguished set of panelists today, but as always, we are counting on you, the participants, to help create a very interactive session. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our great moderator today. Her name is Alice Charles, and she's the project lead for cities, infrastructure, and urban services at the World Economic Forum. Alice, welcome, and the show is all yours. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. You're very welcome to this webinar on urban robots towards smarter and more sustainable cities. So first of all, let me help set the scene just a little bit for this afternoon's discussion, and then I'll take you through our agenda. This AI for Good webinar explores the latest AI-powered robots reshaping urban spaces and city life. As the world is experiencing rapid urbanization with 68% of our population projected to be living in urban areas by 2050, urban growth centers have major challenges in terms of congestion, pollution, food, water security, energy security, access to waste management, and indeed infrastructure maintenance. Cities being at the center of technological changes fueled by the fourth industrial revolution, such as automation and artificial intelligence are rapidly deploying a range of technologies to address a wide range of urban challenges. In this context, autonomous robots are being integrated into the urban landscape to provide smarter and more sustainable and effective solutions in many urban areas, such as, for example, last mile delivery, garbage collection, window cleaning, utility pipes, inspection and repair, mobility services, and indeed police services. And we will explore some of that this afternoon with our panelists that we've gathered. However, technical safety and trust, ethics, data privacy and urban planning concerns must be addressed to ensure that we deliver people-centered, safe and appropriate application of robots within our cities. In addition, cities must have the right capabilities to not only govern and manage robots under their control, but also those deployed in public areas by other entities. This discussion will address the associated ethical concerns, as well as the policies and approaches that need to be put in place to ensure that this technology contributes to a smart and sustainable future in our cities. So in terms of uh, what we will be taking you through over the next hour, um, we will have opening remarks from you in Habitat, this will be followed by a panel discussion, and I will introduce our, our panelists a little later. And finally, we will have a discussion after the, the, panel, uh, the panelists provide their remarks. And we will, of course, have an opportunity for your questions. And in that regard, what I'd like to do is uh, recommend that you uh, post your questions into the platform, the neural platform, uh, as we go through the discussion, so we can incorporate those questions into the discussion today as well. And finally, we'll close out with closing remarks from ITU, um, and I will introduce the, the speaker, of course, at that juncture as well. So without further ado, what I'd like to do is um, introduce 
our representative from UN Habitat who will be providing opening remarks. And that's Abdin, Abdin, sorry, Abdin Nasir Sagar, who is the Associate for uh, Innovation Programs at UN Habitat. Abdin Nasir, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alice, for that introduction. I would like to thank the organizers of this AI for Good webinar and to our uh, very uh, expert panel that we have here today to speak to us on the topic of urban uh, robots. As you all know, the world is experiencing a wave of extreme urbanization and, and that's leading and, and focusing much of the world's greatest challenges and opportunities onto cities. At the same time, as Alice mentioned, we are also witnessing rapid improvements in technology uh, connectivity, internet penetration and speed, and technological advancements, which are of course accelerating digitization, the use of artificial intelligence, connecting autonomous robots as well, and making frontier technologies more efficient. These technological breakthroughs are changing how you know, a society will live, how we, does, how we do business and how we govern ourselves. AI powered urban robotics and autonomous robots and AI enabled and even predictive policing, for example, are emerging practices in cities. Uh, and this is emerging because cities want to deal with the growing urbanization challenges. And there are a lot of opportunities, of course, and benefits to adopting uh, these newer technologies. While this approach has you know, some merit, it also presents serious human rights risks that we need to, to talk about. And any local government implementing these technologies needs to put safeguards in place. For example, uh, recently the UN, the UN Human Rights Commission has said AI technologies can have negative and even catastrophic, catastrophic effects if they're used without sufficient regard for how they affect people's human rights. And they have also recently published a report indicating how this affects human uh, rights and documented serious, you know, numerous cases of, of people being treated unjustly because of AI or even denied, you know, social security benefits or even arrested because of faulty uh, tools and flawed facial recognition. So imagine what can happen with autonomous and AI enabled uh, and AI powered robots in our cities fighting for space in, 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 in the smaller you know, spaces that we have in our cities and taking jobs that are normally uh, done by human beings. How can we uphold human rights in this environment? How can we ensure the safety of everyone in that situation? The thing is local governments do not often think themselves as technology organizations or organizations that need to manage uh, tech, but increasingly much of what city governments, you know, does depends on their ability to create, maintain, and share large quantities of data and deploy, deploy technologies such as robots. So local governments need to have the right capacities to manage these technological systems and machines, while also having the right legal and policy frameworks to govern their deployment, use, and disposal. They also have a significant role to play in the governance and regulation. Much of the regulation for these technologies are being set at either the national or regional levels, and, and there's need to include local governments and, to, and for them to participate in, in, the, in the drafting of these uh, regulations. The other thing is recent studies are actually showing that globally cities are becoming experimental sites for new forms of robotic and automation technologies applied across a wide variety of sectors. Much of this, you know, uh, robotic technologies aren't actually deployed or owned or controlled by local governments or city administrations, but they are popping up and being deployed in environments, in, in public uh, spaces as well. So the question is, who is responsible for them? How are they governed, you know, and how are they integrated into the local infrastructure from roads to other, other infrastructures that cities have. How much do these advancements also contribute to either expanding or inhibiting the current existing inequalities? The other thing is how much do local governments you know, 
need to revise their local urban plans to integrate these advanced uh, technologies that are being introduced, such as uh, robots. So these are questions uh, from a policy perspective that we need to think about uh, and, and local governments need to, to address to ensure the safe uh, use of and the safe deployment of robotic uh, technologies. UN Habitat's preferred approach, of, of course, to AI and AI-powered robots in urban environment is anchored on the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights and UN Habitat's specific mandate to promote inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable cities. It's aligned to our people-centered and climate-sensitive approach to innovation and smart cities, which seeks to make urban digital transformation work for the benefits of all driving sustainability, inclusivity, and prosperity, and the realization of human rights in cities and human settlements. So the question is, how much can we use these autonomous robots to, to achieve uh, these objectives and these goals? It focuses also on addressing safety and urban planning concerns to ensure people-centered, safe, and appropriate deployment of robots within cities. So those are some of the high level observations, trends and approaches that I, I wanted to share with the group today and really looking forward to the contributions from the experts and the discussion that would follow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, uh, Abdeen Nazar. Uh, if you have any questions or comments based on what he just said, please feel free to post them in the neural platform and we'll do our best to weave them into the discussion as we go along. So now to the next section of our webinar. So we will have keynote uh, presentations from each of our panelists and a discussion will follow. So what I'm going to do now is very quickly introduce our speakers um, and they will later provide a presentation one by one. So today joining us will be Fabio Duarte, who is a lecturer in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning in MIT and a principal research scientist at the MIT Sensible Cities Lab. Uh, we also have Zhen Yong Chao, who's the director of the Center for Data Science at Seoul Institute of Technology. We also have Yasmin Farge, who's the COO and co-founder of GoGo -Go Network. And finally, we will have Mercedes Suera, who's the Executive Vice President and Chief Intelligence Officer at Nightscope. So in terms of speaking order, we will first hear from Fabio. And um, so Fabio, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction, and it's a real pleasure to be here. And I'd like to, to, to share with you uh, some slides about the work that we do here at Sensible City Lab, which I believe is very connected to the talk that we're uh, discussing today. Uh, so uh, first, uh, why this topic is important? Because cities, even though they occupy only 3% of the uh, world crust, we have most of population and our energy and CO2 emissions footprint is pretty large. So we have to deal with everything that comes out of cities, but also more and more what we're seeing is this sometimes gap, but sometimes this connection between the physical and social layers of the cities, but also the digital and social layers of the world. So how can we bridge this gap? And here come some of the robots that we are developing, uh, also here at MIT, uh, that makes this connection between how we leave cities and how we understand cities. But with the ultimate goal is to make cities better for everybody. And I will show you two projects uh, today. The first one is called Underworlds. And sometimes when we talk about robotics or AI, we always think about the, the cutting edge technology, uh, but we often forget that we do have in cities centuries old technologies that still do a pretty good job when they exist, correct? So we know that uh, um, several cities around the world, they don't have a sewage system, but for those uh, where we do have sewage system, we start thinking, what could we learn about our lives about public health if we could uh, uh, sample wastewater and trace bacteria, viruses, uh, even dietary habits out of wastewater. It was done a, a few years uh, ago, 
And what we decide to do is that, okay, we know that cities, some cities, they do sample wastewater. But when they do that, they go to the wastewater treatment plant. And by then, what we have is basically dirty water. So we don't know where the sewage is coming from. Uh, the sewage between the orange and the treatment plant, it's carrying also all sorts of environmental data, water, uh, but also we don't know when it was generated. So we decide to change the strategy and start sampling at a very local level. And by doing that, we say, okay, if we go to each manhole and sample, we can have a very fine granular uh, data about uh, uh, public health in cities. The issue is that uh, when we do that, uh, the, the job might be very uh, dangerous. And so we decided to develop a small robots. Uh, and we can see here some of our colleagues sampling. So first we designed this um, uh, Mario. Mario was a, a pretty nice robot that would sample wastewater in different parts of the city. Uh, the problem is that Mario was pretty chubby, so it, was, it got stuck a lot. So we went uh, for Luigi, which is pretty slimmer, and it does not only go into the sewage system, but also it filters uh, the, the wastewater. So we bring only extract to the lab. And finally, we have Yoshi. And Yoshi, we could put these automatic samplers in different parts of the city in a dry ice. And then we program the, the sampler to sample only every 20 minutes, only 100 milliliters. So we could also have a temporal coverage of bacteria, virus, and all sorts of pathogens that we can find in wastewater. This is real data, because we also we found that we should bring this data in a very visually appealing way to public in general, but also to public health officials, so they could work uh, with this data uh, more easily. Uh, and this project, in other words, we deploy here in, in, in Boston, but also in Seoul, in Kuwait, and now we are doing the same thing in Spain. So it's, and another thing that is quite important, after we start doing all these uh, deployments, a company is span out of the lab and this company has been doing uh, COVID monitoring in more than 200 cities in the United States. So this is also an example of how research, when we do research, uh, not only good research, but research for good, we can bring uh, a public value to, to research. Uh, then what we, a few years later, we, we moved to another uh, scale. And this scale uh, is the whole network of waterways in Amsterdam. So as we know, several companies and cities, they are investing a lot to prepare themselves to receive autonomous vehicles. But when we partner with Amsterdam, we, we came up with the following question, which became the, the core of the project. Why would Amsterdam invest in autonomous cars when the city has more than 100 kilometers of canals? So rather than doing that, we decide, what if we go for autonomous boats? The issue is that, as we can see in this picture here, uh, it's a very uh, uh, busy uh, waterway. You have tourist boats, we have small boats, we have these kind of uh, water buses. So it's a very busy way. So what we decide to, to do there is, okay, look, how can we create a system of autonomous boats that can navigate this complex environment here? Uh, and here, what we see is real data of boat traffic in Amsterdam. So we first, we, we designed what we call a global path uh, uh, scheme, where we could determine which would be the best path for each autonomous boat to take when they, they were navigating Amsterdam to avoid traffic. Uh, but then the boat needs to navigate the city. And for this, um, we start embedding some technologies in the boat. In this case, it's a laser scanning. So it's measuring the distance between the boat 
and all other, other obstacles in the city. What's interesting also about this technology that it helps the boat to navigate, it's, it, it's quite important, but also it can uh, monitor what's happening uh, in the city. So every time that the boat's navigating with this LiDAR, it's how the technology is called, it's detecting if we have boats moored uh, where the bridge, even if we have new cracks in the bridges, so we can have this uh, boat uh, almost as an as a infrastructure monitoring of Amsterdam. So we are adding value to the technology as the technology develops. Uh, and what we also decide to do frequently is to engage uh, people uh, in deciding which would be the best use cases for rowboat. So uh, here we have some toolkits that we developed to, to bring uh, residents and students to, uh, to, to, to come up with some ideas. So if the city of Amsterdam decides to use these autonomous boats, uh, which are the, 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 the most useful use cases for the city? So the goal is that we should not only be there to deploy this cool technology, but also make sure that they would be helpful for the citizens. Uh, and then they, they create this, their own ideas. And then, and then, as you can see here, we even model some of these solutions in, in virtual reality environments. So we could measure people's reaction to use an autonomous uh, boat in Amsterdam. And finally, what is nice uh, that I'd like to show is that after five years of project, this is what we have. This is Lucy. Lucy is a rowboat, a fully autonomous, zero emission boat that operates on urban waterways, and she can change the way cities work. As congestion and emissions continue to rise, while cities continue to grow, the existing infrastructure of many cities struggles to keep up. Rowboats offer a solution by moving road traffic to the water. By bringing passengers from A to B, or as an on-demand boat, taking you anywhere you want. And they can also help the city as a multi-purpose work boat. Take Crystal. She is equipped to collect household waste to free the streets from heavy garbage trucks. Robots are fully autonomous, so they navigate without a skipper and can operate 24-7. In order to sail by themselves, robots need to perceive their environment and recognize objects such as bridge pillars, floating objects, and of course, other vessels. The primary source of information comes from a LiDAR sensor, but robots are also equipped with cameras, GPS, and a digital compass. Robots onboard computer combines and processes all of the data and runs the robot software so it can successfully complete its mission plan. After five years of development, testing and experimentation, we have now successfully enabled autonomy on the full-scale prototypes. Robot is ready for the next step. Join us and let's unlock the potential of urban waterways together. So uh, I think with these two projects, uh, I would like to, to just highlight that uh, when we develop robots uh, in general, uh, from the small scale as underworld to the larger scale as robot, I think this interaction uh, with the city, what the city needs and how citizens and residents can be benefited uh, from this technology is key to have robots for good. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any question later. Thank you so much for that, Fabio. I think there's so many applications of, uh, of both. I know when you first launched um, your, your sewage robot, there was a lot of interest from police authorities as well, thinking that they could trace drugs to source. So it wasn't just in the public health sphere. So super interesting. And just for our audience, I'd encourage you to uh, ask any questions or comments, and I'll try to weave them into the conversation with Fabio as well. So now I'd like to uh, turn to our next speaker, who's uh, Jean Young Chao, and he's the director of the Center for Data Science at Seoul Institute of Technology. The floor is yours.
Zhen Yong, you're on mute. Yeah, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, um, I'm working at the Seoul Institute of Technology, and my presentation is about the urban design for an autonomous delivery robot uh, based on unity-based simulation. Um, because of the COVID-19, the non-face-to-face -face services are rapidly growing, such as technologies in urban logistics, such as last mile delivery, has been um, getting attention. The labor and costly last mile delivery is still being handled by la human lab labor. Accordingly, the development of an efficient last mile delivery system using urban robots is being demonstrated worldwide. For this reason, in Korea, urban robots have been introduced in last mile delivery and demonstrated in urban spaces. Simulations in virtual cities are also attempted to overcome the practical limitations of physical urban space. In the smart city activity system, urban robots require different technical and spatial conditions indoors and outdoors. In the outdoor smart city activity system, urban robots require technological infrastructure, similar to autonomous driving vehicles. In Korea, standards for a robot-friendly building certification system have been reviewed. When operating in an outdoor space, there is a problem of sharing the pedestrian space. It is simply solved by barrier-free design, but urban design is required to in-depth consideration of human-robot interactions, such as conflict with robots. For running on autonomous delivery robots, existing regulation did not allow running on a sidewalk or a park and private collecting video footage for self-driving. In the demonstration of autonomous delivery robot ADR, we suggest two cases in Seoul using regulatory sandbox or special approval for outdoor demonstration. This regulatory sandbox temporarily exempt to regulation on running, collecting information for autonomous delivery. But also regulatory sandbox cannot lift to all the barriers because of the safety issues. Therefore, uh, in the presentation, we uh, tried to uh, we, uh, develop the simulation approach using the unity-based game engine to represent interactions with the pedestrian and robots in urban landscape. And also, uh, according to the, this test, we got on some implication for urban design and future impl uh, implementation. In the digital twin system, we suggested three system entities of simulation. One, moving object such as a feature of autonomous delivery robot, delivery system, method of passage. Two, operating conditions such as the level of service of road, pedestrian density. Three, physical environment such as land use. Autonomous driving robots were defined as two types of autonomous delivery robots, uh, road autonomous delivery robots, a a RADR and sidewalk delivery, autonomous delivery robots, SADR, using uh, specification of uh, 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 ADR product from robotics in Korea. In addition, options were applied to the simulation so that the existing spe specification and performance could be upgraded. To measure the operation condition and physical in environment, we define the street design evaluation indicators and street design factors such as uh, physical and operational street entities. To implement the above indicator and factor, we defined the measures and strategies. For example, to simulate the road environment, the slope and material were designed for the sidewalk and the with and waiting space were designed for the crosswalk in the game-based simulation. Uh, as operational enti entities, walking speed, pedestrian density per unit area, and traffic signal cycle were implemented. Pedestrian safety, robot driving stability, efficiency, and 
punctuality were introduced as measures of effectiveness. In the simulation, the horizontal design elements were set for the ADR simulation after the urban space was built in the digital twin in order to evaluate the performance of ADR driving the evaluation index can be calculated. Experiments were conducted through the built simulation. This slide shows two movie clips. The left shows the simulation video of uh, SADR driving along the street to the destination. After setting the departure and destination locations and Petition density of the SADR to be delivered to the test site. When SADR approaches a pedestrian while driving, a bounding box is displayed on the pedestrian and the robot's running speed number of times to avoid the pedestrians and this deceleration and acceleration are recorded. On the right is the video showing a mothership, a type of load autonomous delivery robot, loading and unloading SADR upon arrival at the destination. The simulation of a slide, uh, the simulation of this slide shows the driving case of sharing a road and a bike road that is, uh, that is uh, uh, relatively easy in the digital twin environment, but it's difficult in real life as a safety issue. SADR designed a scenario to drive at five kilometers per hour, like a pedestrian speed on the sidewalk, but at 10 kilometers per hour on a bike road and 20 kilometers per hour on a road. In the simulation, the results were derived by regression anal analysis through analysis using the repeated results. After setting design factors as independent variables and operational operation factors as dependent variables, based on this, optimal urban design and operational guidelines can be derived. The simulation sets the loading zone where the mothership will get up the SADR as shown in the figure on the left. Next, Designate multiple SADR departure and arrival points as shown on the right. Among the street design elements created through, the, through this uh, game-based simulation, the level of service of pedestrian is generated as pedestrians per unit area in each sector in the test bed. The three indicators of the simulation measures of, uh, measure the effect on pedestrians and robots. In the case of safety, Pedestrian safety and robot driving stability are measured. The following results were obtained as a result of regression analysis of evaluation indicators, such as pedestrian safety, robot driving stability, efficiency, and punctuality as, it in, in, as dependent variables with the facility and operation, operation factors of the street as independent variables. In the, in the working safety, it appears that the number of complex decreases is the proportion of delivery routes between the robot only road and the bike only road increases. Also, the higher the pedestrian flow, the greater the number of conflict. Pedestrian, pedestrian density was found to have a negative effect on all performance indicators except for robot stability. Although the number of rail blocks has no significant effect on safety, it appears to have a negative effect on efficiency and punctuality indicators. In the case of robot only roads, while it has a positive effect on walking safety, it has a negative effect on robot safety, but has a positive effect on efficiency and punctuality. This appears to be the result of an increase in the deceleration, acceleration rate at the driving speed increases. The bicycle only road shows the similar effect to the robot only road, but no significant results were obtained in terms of functionality. Based on the experimental result using the simulator, an ADR friendly city or robot city was experimentally designed for urban design, 
curve space delivery method land use characteristics, spatial characteristics of a CDR destination, PD3 and characteristics of robot uh, 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 exclusive lane and communication facilities for autonomous driving were defined. Urban street space design simulation for electric delivery service means can be verified quantitatively and visually through evaluation indicators. It was expected that the flex zone design for the, for the electric delivery service would be possible through the analysis result. Four principles were derived for elements for designing and operating autonomous delivery robot friendly cities. The four principles are to reinvent the curb space, to build smart robot logistics and charging facilities, and to work between pedestrians and robots. The design elements through this are autonomous delivery roads, loading and waiting zones for robots, warehouses and curbs, and uh, operational elements are charging and application facilities and control centers. Through experiments and design principles, a bird eye view of the ADR friendly city was presented as an example for business and residential areas. In the city where a delivery robot on electric means of transportation drives auto autonomously through wireless communication. ADR and PD students share a street space and a micro fulfillment is located as an automated logistics warehouse in the business area for logistic delivery. Last mile delivery of a robot friendly city, which may be a home office, is a system in which self-driving delivery vehicle transport directly. Another example, last mile delivery in a residential area in, in Korea apartment area is expressed as a mobility system in which residents or pedestrian coordinate with an autonomous delivery robot. The urban robot utilization system highlights the importance of the role of a well-controlled and monitored invisible control center in, in order to pursue safety and efficiency where citizens cannot possibly. Through this experiment, we were able to overcome the practical limitations of autonomous driving and artificial intelligence robot operation in virtual space by freely introducing various urban environmental variables by using a digital twin-based realistic tool to provide future city design guidelines. Regarding the SDG, SDG 11 through a safe city where robots and humans coexist, and SDG 9 through a robot-friendly city for humans where robots can be used for human well-being uh, achieve, achievement of a sustainable industrialization. In the second phase, the second phase of our uh, experiment, the implementation of inter in interactions with robots and pedestrians will be advanced. In addition, we plan to experiment with vertical movement using robot elevators and uh, deliberately efficiency using dedicated passages. Thank you for the listening. Thank you very much. That was absolutely fascinating. So uh, in the future, we'll be bumping into robots as we walk down the streets or well, hopefully if they're if they're being effective, they won't bump into us. But um, I was certainly wondering about how uh, they would deal with encountering, for example, people that may be blind or have other physical disabilities. And I'm sure um, many in the audience will have questions in that regard. So now I'm going to turn to our next speaker. Um, who is Yasmin Faj, and she is the COO, the Chief Operating Officer, and co-founder of GoGo Network. Yasmin, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you. Very nice to meet everyone virtually. Do I project or are you projecting my presentation? If you project, that would be great. Okay. Sorry, I'm just having trouble. I'm just checking if uh, Galemi maybe has your, sorry, Galem, I should say, if he has your presentation and could share it if you're having difficulty. Can you see it now? Uh, yes, 
Can it would be great if you could put it in um, full screen. Yeah, full screen, yeah, perfect. All right, perfect. So I think we, I mean, we spoke uh, from the angle of urban robots um, from different angles in the last two presentation. I just wanted to maybe uh, present um, what I've been focusing on for the last four years. So I've been really focusing on autonomous um, robots, both for people and for cargo. So not just like last mile delivery, but also people transportation and trying to see how at the end of the day, robots or uh, autonomous vehicles are gonna change the way both we are moving as people, but also as we are also operating uh, delivery and last mile delivery in city, as we all know, the challenges that last mile uh, represents. Um, so in particular, I think um, what uh, we've been focusing on and what I wanted to share is uh, the problem of last mile delivery for goods and how you can solve that with autonomous robots uh, on sidewalks. So this is just an example picture of the work, uh, an example we are doing uh, in Spain right now, working with different provider and this work, you know, with, a, with an app, you just ask for your food or you ask for um, um, groceries and uh, seamlessly uh, you can either receive it uh, by uh, with a person or you can receive it uh, with a robot. At the end of the day, what we really are focusing on developing a lot of operations, both uh, on the ground and outside on sidewalks, but also in the streets and integrating the different uh, ways of uh, and size of vehicles and, and, and options that you can have for both autonomous delivery of goods and, um, and the passengers. So at the end of the day, when you think of the different players that are in this space, so you have the autonomous vehicles manufacturers that both focus on delivering the hardware, but also the software, which is kind of actually the hardest part. But when you think of an autonomous vehicle, you should think of like almost a cell phone um, on wheel. Uh, and you see uh, then a connection between different mobility use cases that could be, as I was saying, small sidewalk robots or larger like trucks or, or smaller vehicles that are in between a truck and a sidewalk robot that go on the street, or even like uh, autonomous lockers, Amazon type lockers that would have like codes and packages that are waiting for people instead of having to be delivered at home. And in between, let's say the use cases and the provider of the vehicles, um, you have to have this integration layer, right? So the supervision platform, of course, to make sure that like um, the delivery A to B or point uh, A to uh, delivery point is, is happening. That uh, of course the supervision and teleoperation of the vehicle can be done at, at any point. And that of course there's integration between the different customers and the different providers of uh, the technology. So, I mean, we spoke about it. I think uh, we don't have to highlight on the benefits of why uh, actually robots are a positive outcome for the future in terms of sustainability, um, uh, less cars, and of course, then less traffic and noise and accidents uh, that we can see. And this is some data on the, you know, just some figures that I'm sure you've seen before on some of those uh, KPIs that I was mentioning. And this is just also about like for people, how it can be a bit more convenient and also more economical to actually have in the future those uh, services and robots uh, shaping and changing the way we interact with our food or with our packages. And, and, and again, like with the idea that of course um, there should be cost savings, but the most important is just to also be in a more, in a cleaner city and that have a more reliable at all time ability to get, uh, to get services. Um, this is just to show a couple of examples on city of where the service is already operating from, of course, like the US have been uh, leading the way, but Asia and Middle East as well. Uh, Europe, we are, uh, I think, through uh, regulation still um, 
in a bit harder uh, to scale continents, but it's also getting there with, I think, now a, a real focus from both the European Union and, um, and the countries to actually be able to offer uh, regulation to allow for those services to happen. Um, I also just wanted to share a, a video on um, to maybe synthesize a bit the vision that we have uh, for uh, urban mobility and how you will see both the transportation of passengers and of cargo and delivery can be seamlessly integrated in a city that now is more green and that is given back to people instead of being given as it is today to cars and how Europe can also be at the center of this revolution. Only this sound. A European regulatory system will encourage investment for shared and self-driving electric mobility across the continent, paving a clear path to market and creating a healthy, competitive landscape, transforming the way people and goods are transported to remote areas as well as bustling cities, building a new chapter in mobility much safer, less polluted, less congested, and human-centric. We believe that Europe can be at the forefront of the mobility revolution. Join the mobility revolution with GoGo Network. Okay, that's it. I'm going to pause here. Thank you all for attention. Thank you very much for that, Yasmin. Uh, fascinating to, to see your perspective, particularly with regard to last mile delivery. So um, I'm going to turn to our final speaker. It's Mercedes Sora, and she's the Executive Vice President and Chief Intelligence Officer of Nightscope. Mercedes, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to present. Uh, let me share my screen really quick. Um, can you all see my screen right now? Yes, perfectly. Awesome. So, <clears throat> excuse me, my name is Mercedes Soria. I'm Executive Vice President and Chief Intelligence Officer at Nightscope. Nightscope is, used to be a startup that uh, was funded in Silicon Valley. Uh, with the aim to address the security guarding uh, problem that we have in the United States. Um, the company started in 2013 um, and we just went public about a couple of months ago. So what you see here on the screen, oh, sorry, what was that? Oh, sorry, uh, what happened? Okay, uh, no. Okay, so the agenda for today is one of the things that I wanted to make sure with this presentation was that I would tie it to some of the sustainable goals uh, for the UN that we have. Um, so what we're going to cover today is what is Nightscope? What are the technologies that we use? Uh, why is it AI for good? as this conference says, and then how do we tie what we do to the UN Sustainable Goals? And at the end, I will speak some about what are the challenges that a company in robotics can have when they're trying to expand to different cities and to expand to provide more services to, uh, to people in different cities that, are, that we deploy our, our robots to. So um, it's kind of a little bit difficult to explain what we do. So the short answer is, if you see a security robot out there, a security guard out there, their job is very monotonous. Uh, they just have to walk around and they don't really need to do much unless there is something that happens that requires their action. So this is a job that has a 300% turnover rate. So uh, every three months you get a brand new team. And that is where the opportunity was to automate such a, such a task. Um, and the best way to explain it is, <clears throat> excuse me, by showing you a 30 second video of what Nightscope does. We've got you covered 24-7, 365. 
Nightscope's autonomous security robots have already logged well over 1 million hours of operation for our clients across the country. Our technology has proven to help in fighting crime, providing security and public safety professionals unprecedented situational awareness. Learn more about how Nightscope's cost-effective security robots help secure the places you live, work, study, and visit today. Secure a demo at nightscope.com. We've so that so that is what we do. I hope it's a little more clear now. So this is a deployment that we have in a city of Huntington. So in this play, in this deployment, our customer is actually the police at that location. And what the robot does is it patrols around autonomously 24/7, uh, and it uses AI to detect what is out of the ordinary that we need to communicate to the actual humans so they can go basically enforce the law. So we have a lot of sensors in this robot um, that you can see, feel, hear, and smell everything around it and can collect things like um, phone, phone numbers, <clears throat> excuse me, phone numbers, uh, faces, uh, what's going on around it with uh, AI. And um, we already have deployed around the United States. Uh, and the goal of Nightscope is to make the U.S. the safest country in the world. And we're doing it um, one deployment at a time. So what are the technologies that we use? We use robotics. Obviously, there's a robot here. Uh, and this robot uses lighters, which have been mentioned before this uh, in this afternoon. So to, be, to determine where it is in location to, to in relationship to other things at that location. We use artificial intelligence to, for the system to learn what is something that normally happens at this location and what is something that is out of the ordinary. So we can then let actual security guards know. Um, we use machine learning. That's how we learn what's going on at a business. That's how we learn how to determine that a face that the customer wanted me to uh, alert them about if I saw that face. How do, we, how do we determine that this is a face that matches the be on the lookout list of our customers? And we finally use natural language processing. Our robots are able to um, provide broadcast, that, um, broadcast and live audio uh, on top of intercom for all of our customers. So if let's say that there was, um, usually the robots get deployed to places and cities that are very um, difficult for security guards to patrol or that are very dangerous, uh, so dangerous that not even the police will go to those locations. So we've had a lot of success. Uh, our website has all of the great crime fighting wins that we have had. And I'll t tell you about one of those, <clears throat> which is at a hospital down in Southern California. So they used to have a lot of break-ins every night in the, in the parking lot. Uh, and the shift ends at 3 a.m. and people used to be very worried about going out there at that time of the night because there was there was a lot of crime and there were some gangs there that were involved and the police wouldn't even go there because of how dangerous this place is. So they decided that they're gonna put a robot there uh, to figure out just if it changes what's going on and change the patterns, then it actually did. So now the crime from that location has moved to other locations in the city, but now uh, nurses and doctors can go to their cars at night. There's no break-ins uh, since the robot was installed. Uh, there is, people are not afraid and the level of crime has gone literally down to zero. So that's how we use these robots. Um, one of the, one of the things that I wanted to make sure that we show is how effective has these robots been? Have these robots been? So in just that one deployment at Huntington Park in Los Angeles County, uh, the cost for service uh, went down for the police agency from 277 to 249 in a six month period. And they were able to arrest 27% more people due to different types of crime that was happening because one of the things that the robot does is it provides you eyes and ears where a human can never pro, uh, provide you that sort of thing. Um, a security guard can be in one place, but it would see a person committing a crime or see a person that runs. It's very unlikely that that security guard is going to remember exactly the face of that person. But if you have a security guard that saw this event, we have that picture of that person and we can 
match that to a database uh, from the police uh, agency at um, Huntington Park. Also, crime reports. <clears throat> One of the reasons why our robot is five foot tall and 400 pounds is because of the physical presence. So a uh, majority of the time, if somebody puts a police car in front of a house, uh, the criminals are going to go somewhere else. They won't go in front of that. And that's what's happening with the robots. So whenever we have a robot, criminals go somewhere else. And, the, and obviously the crime reports go down so much down that we've had a 46% reduction there in the city of Huntington Park. And the citations that have uh, been given as well have gone down from 120 citations to 38. That's a 68% uh, reduction in how people are behaving that need to be given citations for bad behavior. So this is some clear wins and some clear value that the robot produces. So we want to tie, I wanted to make sure that we tie this to the sustainable development goals of the UN. So one of the things that we do is for goal number three, good health and well-being. So we're providing peace to all of the locations where we're going to deploy, all of the corporate campuses, airports, hospitals, even casinos. They all experience a lot more peace and a lot more uh, well-being when the robots are around um, to make sure that things don't go out of um don't go badly over in those locations. Uh, there's affordable clean energy. So currently the security guards use cars, uh, just gas power cars uh, to go around the different locations where they have to patrol. This, this is clean energy that we're using for these robots. They only, they're electric powered um, and therefore they have no emissions. So by that we're, uh, we're addressing that sustainable development goal. For sustainable development goal number eight, decent work and economic work, economic growth. Uh, for example, the people who used to have to do the security guard job, which was very boring, now they're doing a higher end job and they get paid more and it's more interesting, which is managing robots, managing a fleet of robots. So they get to learn more, they get to actualize uh, their skill sets and they get a better paying job. Uh, and there's a reduction of unemployment for those people who, who didn't like to do the job before. We also do a lot of innovation. So we use the newest technologies and AI, NLP, machine learning, uh, to learn and protect the infrastructure of locations like, um, <clears throat> uh, hospitals and airports and all of those places that I mentioned before. So we also aim to reduce inequalities. So if we give people a better job, people who normally might not have a job or who might have a security guard job, um, there's not really that many requirements for someone to be a security guard. So um, those people tend to not have that much education sometimes. And what we do is we educate them in the job in terms of how they can use robots to do a better job and to have a higher income. So that's the goal with that. And goal number 11, which is sustainable cities and communities. Um, we have less carbon emissions than any patrol car, as I said before, and it allows us to um, have a better standard of living of the people that are at the locations that we are actually deployed at. And again, number 16 is peace, justice, and strong institutions. Uh, the number one goal of our robots, at least so far, is to make the United States of America the safest country in the world. We're currently deployed around the U.S. and affecting crime rates going down in all those locations that we're deployed at. So the more peace that you have, the less conflicts that there will be. And if you can think of a future in which you have the security robots at every single block in every city, at every single school, at every single airport, at every single parking lot, if you think about this as having these locate this around the whole world, we can make the world a better place um, and give people a safer place to, to exist. So having said that, we've been in business since 2013. So there have been some um, growth and application challenges that I wanted to talk about that are related to specifically urban robots and cities. Um, so first of all is the perceived lack of privacy. So because we collect the video 24 seven, um, people think that we are inviting their privacy sometimes, but what they don't realize is that if they go to a 
grocery store, if they go to the airport, if they go to the mall, everywhere they go, there's already cameras that are taking their video. So we're not doing anything different than, than what people are already used to. So there's a, there's a good amount of education that needs to take place. Uh, everywhere we go deploy these robots so people can understand that, hey, we're not spying on you. All we're doing is trying to keep you safe. So the adoption by organizations is another one. So uh, there's the sales cycle for a security robot goes anywhere between 30 days and 36 months. That's just how long it takes because you have to get the approval of uh, human resources, of the security team or the cybersecurity team, procurement team, HR team. So all those people have to come together and approve the deployment of a security robot to their locations. And that can take a long time. Uh, and also, once we have a document that is signed, a contract that uh, uh, somebody wants a robot, we still have to go and do things like mapping. Um, someone else showed earlier, what, what does the robot see in terms of um, a point cloud, which is the lighters that are used on the top of the robot. So that takes time to show the robot, this is your new location, and these are the places that you're allowed to go into. Uh, and, and we have to do a lot of what we call TLC, which is tender loving care to deploy a robot and to make sure that it does what it's supposed to do and goes in the paths that is allowed to go into. Also, this will enable cities to deploy more security. So right now there is a shortage, at least in the United States, there's 1 million um, police officers and 1 million guards. Uh, and if we think about the fact that for guards, Every three months, somebody gets a new, a new, a new team of security guards. We can see how that could be detrimental to cities uh, in terms of how the new person does the new person really understand what's going on in that location. Uh, they've lost all the knowledge that the prior security guards had, and now they have to go back and learn it all again and try to figure out what are the things that usually happen here that are normal and what are the things that we should really pay attention to. Uh, in terms of protecting cities, citizens, um, we're trying to do that, um, especially in locations where there's a lot of dangers, like the hospital that I had mentioned before. Um, and sometimes they don't, they don't understand necessarily what we're trying to do. Uh, as I mentioned before, they might see a robot as somebody, as a machine that is invading their privacy, or they see a machine and, and they try to figure out, okay, what does it actually do, or what does it not do? They have uh, several, we have had a few number of examples of deploying robots to protect a location uh, in a city. And um, the people who were around that location didn't know what it was or what it did. So we had to make changes in our deployment process so we can do a lot more education. So we can educate people that the robots are here and the robots are here to stay and they're here to protect you. So um, they might also not trust the technology yet. Robotics is not actually mainstream yet. It's becoming mainstream right now. There's a number of, of robot companies, robotics companies that have started in Silicon Valley and in other places around the, uh, around the world um, that enables people to, okay, see that there's more robots and they have more faith on what they do and how they can be useful in urban cities of the future. So one of the things that has been interesting for Nightscope and the last, since COVID started was scaling up. We're scaling up to more cities, to more deployments, to, to more uh, locations around the US. But then we have supply chain issues that have been brought up, especially from um, COVID-19. So we have a backlog of about over a million dollars of robots that we have to build and deploy, but the parts are not actually here yet. So that, that's, a, that's one of the challenges of scaling up in a time of COVID, as you can imagine. And also we enable environment. Um, there's a lot of regulations that should be passed. The reason why Nightscope can, can, doesn't need a regulation to be able to go and be deployed at a location is because we deploy, we are only less than five miles per hour uh, and we're on private property. So to make this solution more worldwide and more citywide uh, and more expanded to other places, 
there needs to be legislation or there needs to be regulations to say this is what a robot can do in a public place, this is what it can do in a public road, this is, these are the things that it's allowed to do and not do. So there's a lot of regulation that should be put in place. And we're working with some um, people in Washington, D.C., especially in the United States, uh, to make sure that those regulations get passed and they don't get in the way of giving people the best way to protect themselves, which is what we believe Nightscope does. So with that, I close up. And uh, if you want to know more about Nightscope, you can go to www.nightscope.com. Or you can tweet us at iNightscope. Uh, so with that, thank you so much. Thank you so much for that, Mercedes. That was fascinating to see how your robots are, are fighting crime. And um, so to our audience, you've heard uh, uh, solutions in terms of AI for good this afternoon. You've heard that through the lens of how urban robots are helping to offer services in our cities to make them more smart and sustainable. The next part of our webinar is uh, focused on questions and answers. So I will, of course, pose some questions to, to the panelists, but I'd really like to hear from you. And I'd just like to remind you, if you have any questions or comments, to post them, please, in the, the neural network platform. So to get the conversation started, um, if I could turn to, um, to our panelists, what I'd love to hear from you is, what do you believe is required to create a test bed to test robotics and AI in the urban context. Um, Fabio, do you want to maybe get the conversation started? Yeah, definitely. So I think one key aspect is to get residents involved. I think when we're doing experiments with uh, data or robots, I think we should always have in mind that the ultimate user and client a citizen's residence. So I think it's unfair to do anything either for, 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 for uh, security reasons or health reasons or transportation if we don't have those who be directly affected by that uh, engaged from the very beginning. Thank you for that, Fabio. Um, Mercedes. I'm on mute. Um, do you mind repeating the question, please? So I'm wondering what needs to happen in our cities to make them a test bed for robotics and AI. So some of the things that uh, we need to be conscious of, especially when we have robots, um, as for example, the how are the streets uh, paved? Are they even? Are they uneven? Because robots have to transverse through those streets. Right, so there has to be planning ahead of time that says a robot that is ADA compliant can actually drive in these streets opposed to cities where you have a lot of potholes or you have sewer systems or something is, um, there's water on the ground. That, that type of thing needs to be fixed first before a robot can be transversing locations like that. So that could be one of the issues that we have in terms of how to adapt it to cities. Thank you very much for that. Um, any further comments, uh, Jean Young? I, I think my, my, my colleague will be better better answer for the question. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, my name is Sung Kim. I am working at uh, Chris. Actually, I have uh, uh, many ideas of, of uh, these challenges but most of all I mean, first I think the uh, accept, acceptance of human is the most difficult factor of this so as you know uh, TAM technology acceptance models we have it so to uh, crude I mean the uh, the robot uh, the, to survive, robot uh, for robot to survive in this environment in the uh, human uh, street, I think the people should ac accept the existence of the uh, robot in the street. We have to share those streets, and and then uh, to do that, I think yeah, the uh, psychological factor 
is the is the one. The second will be the human based uh, street design. So we have many uh, measures and barriers uh, for robot, but it is good for human. For example, the uh, uh, braille braille block, which is the yeah many, which is which is very big uh barrier and harder for robots. Yeah, for example, yeah we have we have a lot of uh those kind of safety measure, but for robot it's the those are harder. That can be my answer. Yeah, and it is it's also if I may my interest up here. Um, there's a lot of thought that I'm sure all of you have gone through, which we have as well, about what does the human robot interface looks like? Because for all the robots, whether it's a, a robot that is transporting something, whether it's a robot that is cleaning something, whether it's a robot that is trying to protect people, we cannot make something that looks this scary. So I'm sure you all have seen Spot, the robot that looks like a dog. Um, it's been tried several times to use in different cities, but they cannot get it to a level in which uh, people will accept it. There still is care of it. So there's a lot of care that all of the companies in this call have to go through to make sure that um, the robots are accepted by people opposed to be something that scares people. So super interesting. So we need a combination of regulation. We need urban environments that are conducive for uh, adapting these types of robots. And we also need um, human acceptance. So I guess in terms of the human acceptance piece, um, there's, you know, we're seeing some questions coming in as well from our audience, but there's a lot of uh, people that are very skeptical, you know, in terms of the impact that this is going to have on their citizen rights and their privacy. And I'd love to get your thoughts on, you know, the policies that you believe are needed to protect the privacy and rights of citizens at the same time as deploying and scaling um, uh, robotics within the urban context. Uh, Mercedes, maybe would you have any thoughts on that? Yes, yes. So one of the things that have been put in place that I completely, we completely agree with is uh, for you to have access, for you as a company, as a robotic company, to be able to take a picture of a face and to be able to tell uh, the, the police that, hey, I just saw someone that is in the FBI top 10 list, right? For to be able to do that, that is not open to just any company. You have to have an agreement with a security agency, with a police agency that is willing to let you access their records. Uh, and that is something very important. So otherwise anybody would be able to access that live and, and do a lot of things. But by partnering with a police uh, agency, there's, a, there's another stop there that says, yes, you're legit. So because you partner with them and because we trust the, uh, the police, then we're going to trust you as well. So those things are important. You find supporters that actually approve what we're doing. Fabio? Yeah, so I think uh, one topic that's quite important is to discuss the trade-off between benefits and, and privacy. So every time that you search something on Google, you are giving out your data, but you are fine with that because you are receiving back some important information. So where can I find something about ITU? You Google it. Uh, and the, the, the opposite sometimes happen on Facebook, for instance. They are always also collecting the same type of data, but what they're giving us back. So I think for all these privacy issues, the main question is, okay, what the trade-off between data privacy and benefits? And of course, the example that you gave is a, is a really good one because there's also the issue of trust there, right? That we, we tend to place greater trust with an international organization or a government, although that can vary according to governments around the world than we do necessarily with private corporations. Uh, Su Kim or Zhang Yang, I'd love your perspective. I think uh, actually it's dark, but we cannot solve this uh, perfectly. Always there will be uh, contradictions and challenging about it. So I think the most important part is it should be political. 
So we have to discuss prominently, always, and then we have to uh, how can I say, persuade people. It can be beneficial. Uh, but still, uh, I don't want to complain the government, but uh, most governments are slow, slow for those new technology and development. So they cannot understand and they are afraid of uh, the these political uh, discussions. So it's, it's very, I think, uh, sophisticated, yeah, difficult problem. For example, we have one, uh, absolute, I mean, perfect example of the government problem. So I think you can recall uh, from our presentation, our sandbox, they, they can deregulate the recording part, recording the video part, but we have the uh, camera on the uh, road, every road. Our soul is very uh, complexity, but complexity, so we have almost perfect video recording system on every road. So actually they are, yeah, they know our every move, but still they regulate our uh, video recording system in the robot on the road. So is like, I don't know, uh, <laughs> imperfect, imperfect system or regulation should be changed, but they don't. Uh, for some reasons. So yeah, that's my opinion. Thank you so much for that. I guess we started to move into the lens of um, scaling as well. And maybe we can talk a little bit more about that. So, you know, your solutions are wonderful and, and you've um, very much deployed them at the pilot stage. And I think Mercedes has, uh, her company has moved to scaling those solutions. I'd love to get your thoughts on what you need from government to help you move uh, you know, from a sort of a pilot stage to uh, scaling deployment and replication of those deployments in cities around the world. So um, maybe if I start with Fabio, because you've been on quite a journey with uh, robot, uh, sorry, uh, in Amsterdam and, and also um, with the, the, um, the, the application of, of the sewage robot. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about what needs to happen from a policy perspective to get to scale. In the case of Underworlds, where we start deploying these small robots in the sewage system, uh, I think uh, we, we, we need a very basic uh, help from the government, which was access to the manholes. And, and obviously this is very trivial, but at the very beginning we had to block streets and it was a pretty uh, substantial operation. Uh, so it's true that uh, cities can be very helpful and what they got in exchange was public health data in different neighborhoods. So I think it's uh, from our perspective, from the research perspective, uh, I think it's fair when we ask public officials for some help, help uh, to know what we're giving back to them. Uh, so is to not have a one-way uh, help approach. So I think this is very important. Sometimes uh, I, uh, we, we, when we turn a research into a business like under words, when we, and the same thing is going to, with robot now. Uh, I think if we have this perspective that I not only need some help, but I'm giving you something also beneficial to you, uh, it helps a lot to facilitate this communication. So for you, it's been around exchange and partnership um, has helped you to, to get these solutions um, to, to scale. To scale um, yes. I'd love to hear from uh, Sue Kim um, about your experience in Seoul. Yeah, uh, actually I haven't, uh, my research is on the simulation part, so I haven't actually uh, used or uh, exempt uh, experiment any uh, actual robot. So I uh, we actually persuaded the uh, city and our organization about the simulation benefit of the simulation. So without uh, any risk actions or accident, we can uh, we can uh, provide what will be 
uh, need uh, what they they will need uh, for the adoption of these new technologies. That's going to be our benefit. And then actually we uh, let them know. We explained every uh, benefit of our, our simulation, and they yeah, allow us uh, to develop those uh, uh, simulation tools. So I think those explanation and uh, demonstration uh, will be helpful to uh, government agency uh, understand our technology and our uh, research. But it is actually it is still uh, difficult, and indeed it is actually uh, take time. So yeah, we had we had many uh, demonstration and presentation uh, to persuade those agencies. That's our experience. Great, thank you for that. And Mercedes, you've actually made it to scale. So from your perspective. You know what policy interventions are, or how did uh, government help you to get to scale? So something that we would need, that we need, and um, we're trying to to move that along in Washington D.C. is crystal clear regulation and what comes to um, what kind, what is uh, PAI, personal identifiable information, right? What what is it okay to share with which companies and why? And also regulations as to what can a robot do or not do in a city, in a roadblock, in a block, in a water for some of you. Because what happens is that we end up having to do a lot of education to our potential customers and also to our customers. We have to hold webinars, we have to have signs, we have to give them training. There's a lot just so they can have this idea of you're inviting my privacy not be in their minds, right? Not be in their heads. So if we had the, the help of government that says, here are the laws of privacy in the United States, we could take that to our customers and say, here you go, this is all the education that you need, and it can help us uh, move along the process a lot more quicker. Super interesting. And a, and a question that's come in from our audience is around um, the potential loss of employment. Um, that if we are to deploy robots at scale. And I think Mercedes, you were saying that you had found the opposite, that actually there was more quality employment resulting. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so so first of all, you can start with what the problem is. And the problem is that uh, security guards don't like their jobs. They just don't. They, they're bored, they quit. Uh, you get a new team every three to six months. So therefore, those people who were security uh, guards now, three months later, they might not have employment at all because they just didn't like to do their job. So what we have done in the places that we got to is, okay, you have five security guards and now you're going to implement a fleet of robots. It's not a one-to-one -one replacement. It's, we want to make sure that that's understood. So what we do is you will have two security guards and three robots that cover the same 24 seven that you were covering with like eight people, right? And then the people that are left, they get trained to monitor those robots. And for that, they need training on computer science, how to, how to manage a robot, how to do browser um, setup, how to do navigation of a robot and things like that. And that is actually a job that because requires technical knowledge, pays you more than a, than a job with just as a security guard. So instead of displacing people, what we're doing is putting them in situations in which they can do better. It's better for them to do their jobs and, and they have a more impactful performance with what they do every day. That's what we have found and, and what we're doing. Fabio, any thoughts? Are you taking jobs away from humans and giving them to robots or actually are you creating uh, higher end jobs? That's a very important question, but I think this is a, a, a centuries old question, right? Every new technology uh, will change the way we deal with the world. So we might argue that, and it's true, that uh, digital computers have taken the place of human computers that used to, to input all data uh, before. So I think this has happened several hundreds of times uh, with any technological development. So it will happen again, yes, but most probably you're gonna have hopefully better jobs. Uh, just to give a very 
concrete example, uh, when I first show the, the, the sewage system in a city where they have that, imagine the cities that don't have the technology and we still have some people collecting sewage. Uh, is it a good job? No, definitely not. Uh, that technology has changed, uh, has uh, replaced some human workers. Yes, it has. But are we really, really willing to go back to people removing sewage from streets? Is to Kim, what do you think? I think it's true. Robot actually, yeah, taking uh, many jobs from a uh, human. But I think it's not an uh, engineer's problem. It's, I think, a sociological problem. So uh, our society should focus on the other issues uh, without the physical things. More psychological uh, issues or education, as, as someone actually mentioned in the uh, chat. And, and our soul, for example, so we are focusing on actually efficiency when we develop these uh, technologies, which means uh, less input, more output. And less input means less human or less labor. So it's natural yeah, to take some jobs from human. But instead of those efficiency-based uh, problems, we can focus on more non-efficient non-efficient problem, which will be those, yeah, sociology or yeah, some non-technological uh, area. And I think that, I mean, I mean, in the big area, I think that's the path of the human in the future. I'm Thank you very much. Very, <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for that. So we will see some job losses, but we may well end up with some higher quality jobs. So um, there will be a certain uh, requirement for education, for reskilling and upskilling within the existing workforce. So that is bringing our section of the Urban Robotics Towards Smarter and More Sustainable Cities uh, webinar to a close. We have heard some wonderful examples of application of robotics in an urban context from, uh, for example, analyzing our sewage systems to autonomous boating, to last mile delivery, uh, to offering security services within our cities. And I think we've just sort of um, hit the, the tip of the iceberg here. We, we could talk about this for hours. So we are going to have to close the session and I'm going to turn to our ITU representative to close out this session. I'm going to hand over to Christina Bouti, who's the counselor for ITU T, uh, SG20, TSB, United for Smart and Sustainable Cities project. Christina, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Alice. I would really like to thank our panelists for their insights into bringing the role of robotics in, in smart sustainable cities to the spotlight. And I would like also to thank um, you for really facilitating the excellent and insightful discussions relating really to the field of robotics within the urban domain. Um, a, a special thanks goes, of course, also to our esteemed organizer, Yanabi, that is all participants for today's uh, webinar. I think as we are aware, the, the rapid rise in urban populations has presented the world with umping, you know, challenges, including environmental pollution, public security, red congestion, and I think, you know, the last one that, that we all face is the COVID-19 pandemic, which certainly presented unprecedented challenges related to health. So after today, I believe we can all agree that the field of robotics can play a significant role in, in really driving uh, a transformative changes that can be really associated with many of the challenges, especially in the field of, uh, you know, security, transportation, you know, emergencies. And as we have witnessed from today's presentations, uh, leveraging robotics has really evolved beyond what we thought at least till a few years ago, the mere hospitality related tasks performed in the year, for example, of museum guides, 
up to more core services or oriented tasks that are performed by automated delivery, autonomous vehicles, or autonomous boating or patrolling robots. So in the role has, if I can call them digital agents, <laughs> robots can really be prime enablers of um, a smart and sustainable sea division worldwide. And, and in this context, I believe that the presentations that were delivered today specifically provided uh, real life use cases in cities related to the deployment of robots for a variety of, of sectors, including ships, transportations, and you know, last but not least, we, we saw Mercedes presentation on surveillance and patrolling, you know. So, so these use cases are particularly relevant uh, because they they really have um, you know, shown how robots can perform tasks that can both also create new opportunities, uh, as you highlighted at the end, you know, new uh, high-end jobs, despite, you know, we, we are cognizant that there might be some job loss uh, percentage that has to be taken into consideration. Um, in all this time context, I would like uh, to highlight also uh, the work that has been done in this area by the United for Smart Sustainable City Initiative, which is a UN initiative supported by 17 UN agencies, including ITU and UN Abidat, and you know that has conducted work on certain facets of robotics in cities. Uh, for example, in, in one of the latest U4SEC report on accelerating city transformations using frontier technologies, it explores also the application of robotics for several important urban verticals. Um, and, and one of the important aspects that was also highlighted today and that I hope will be taken forward in, is especially that robots can be used for public good and then can really help achieve the sustainable development goals. There are still some challenges to, to be addressed, such as public access, acceptance, the lack of regulation that needs to be put in place. There's also brought you know, the need for, I think, moving towards privacy-centric human-robot interactions, which are really focused on, on ensuring personal data protection above all. And I'm also sure that the discussion on this topic do not end here today. We, we really have a long way to go in terms of normalizing the adoption of AI-powered robots across different verticals in the urban context. So uh, considering today is to be the stepping stone for future work on this topic, I really would like to thank you, you once again for joining um, the ITUAI good, for good webinar today uh, with the hope uh, that we are able to continue this dialogue also on other avenues. I would like also to wish everyone really a wonderful day ahead, and I encourage you to continue to be engaged in the neural uh, network uh, for networking. So now I think it's time to close this event, and I would like now to hand over to Anna, who will provide some technical information also now to connect uh, on the neural network. Thank you, and I wish you all a lovely day. Thank you. Thank you for participating in today's AI for Good session. We hope you've learned something new, innovative, and engaging in today's event. We now encourage you to continue the conversation on the live video wall in the neural network. Here you can ask questions. Like and comment, share links, complete the satisfaction survey, connect with interesting profiles, or speak one-on-one -on -one using the chat and video function. After the 30-minute networking session, we invite you to explore the lobby, try the smart matching quiz, visit the virtual exhibits and poster boards, and build your personalized AI for good program. It was a pleasure learning with you today. See you at the next AI for good.